thank you, everyone. Um, I was asked to do a um, like 45 minute introduction to child trauma for you guys. I thought that instead of giving you uh, any of the academic stuff, I would just try to hit you with a video. And the video is not very long. I hope this works. I, I've never done it this way. But I'm going to um, play the video and and then I'm going to interrupt it and talk about what's going on and try to do the didactics about the tra about trauma as it relates to the video. But if it gets too confusing, then just tell me next, tell me later, and then next time I, I'll just show the video all the way through. <laughs> the video is basically from a um, day in the life of a principal in Boston. This was on CBS. Where we're going to start the video is where the principal states that in the school hats are not allowed to be worn okay and also if you want to interrupt the video as well just start speaking and i'll stop the video okay here we go to learn it's just one of the rules that we're trying to work with he took my hat my hat was on the table it was not on my head why would i walk around and put a hat on my head let me go up and see him you wait here this student is angry that his hat was confiscated by one of his teachers. A minor incident at some schools. How are we doing? At Madison Park. Chuck McAfee knows things can quickly spin out of control. I put my hat on the table. Other teachers didn't have a problem with that. Why did he have a problem with it? What are issues that's going on here that I'm not getting? It reflected me. See, I mean, I'm trying to figure this out. There's always two sides of the stories. I mean, I cannot imagine why someone coming down to my office about just his hat. If he wasn't wearing his hat, yeah. why would the teacher take my hat? Yeah. I don't know. He, he had his hat. He left his hat in a place it wasn't supposed to be. I took his hat. What's the point? He doesn't really perform at, at any kind of acceptable level. Um, he caught a real nasty attitude about it. Why do I want to leave school? Yeah, I know. He can relax and about his hat uh, and get his hat at the end of the school day. <laughs> or you said at lunchtime? Well, see, I'm at lunchtime if I'm a nice guy and you don't treat me bad. When you leave here. Did he say anything? Yeah, he called me all kinds of names. He was swearing oh, at me and everything. Before he was leaving, he called No, you know me. I, you know. Uh, but before he left here, I was all kinds of, uh, you know, MF, A, S type oh, stuff. Oh, I see. All right. How are we doing? Go ahead. Okay, uh, so she said that this is a common experience for them, that when they give children any kind, any, of any age directives, then oftentimes it means they respond like that, uh, with a nasty attitude, calling me MFAS, whatever those things might mean. Mayflower and <laughs> Abraham, who knows. Um, okay, and the typical response to that is, consequences, punishments, uh, maybe socialization about how you should behave without really dealing with what might be triggering all of that nasty attitude, right? And so what we do as trauma experts is that we champion an understanding of children's behaviors as a, as a consequence of trauma. And we don't know any, anything about this kid yet, but we usually take a universal precautions approach meaning that any one of us could have trauma and any of us could be reactive because of trauma. And it, honestly, it doesn't even matter if you don't need to know whether someone has a trauma history because you can just tell as soon as you start hearing nasty attitudes and MF and S and A, then just assume that they have trauma because the way you deal with a traumatized person is actually a nice way to deal with everyone. Okay. Yes. Okay. So the comment is the teacher created problems by uh, creating stress for no reason, and you're already jumping ahead to what I, the take-home message is, is act, actually about like the fact that I said that all of us are vulnerable to trauma. And what you heard from the teacher is, I took his hat because he doesn't perform in any kind of way. That makes no sense. How does t taking someone's hat help them perform better in class? So again, like, just in the same way that a student can have a nasty attitude, the teacher's swearing and cursing at this kid through behaviors as well. And it's, I would argue, to assume a trauma, that it's a trauma-reactive moment. 
And not because I'm trying to exonerate the behaviors, but I'm trying to explain how to manage the behaviors so that you're not going to have escalation of trauma reactions. Okay? Yes. Correct. So the teacher educator said she agrees that teachers also have trauma. And if you notice, you see that posture there? That's defensive, right? Like all of us, we, we all have limbic systems. We're all warm-blooded mammals with thousands of years of evolution to know that that body language means I'm a little bit anxious right now, feeling a little attacked. And then he's blaming the student for all the things that went wrong, right? Okay, so let me explain the foundation of the trauma-informed perspective. And it really does have to do with the simple thing about fight or flight. And I will just use my hand instead of PowerPoint to describe what I mean. This is your brain. This is about, see, eyeballs here, brain stem. See, look, it turns just like my brain, same size as my brain. <laughs> All sensory information travels up through the brain stem. And where my thumb is, there's an alarm in there. For some of you science geeks who are still in school, it's called the amygdala. It's part of the limbic system. And the amygdala's, well, one hemisphere of the amygdala's entire job is just to look for threat. There's another part of the brain that kind of packages information into something that the brain can work with. And as, as it's doing that, the amygdala is looking at it and saying, you're OK, you're OK, you're OK. But then as soon as something potentially threatening comes on, the amygdala immediately triggers the fight or flight response. Before, before your body even knows what's happening, before your brain, I mean, before your brain even has registered what's going on, the amygdala can get you ready to fight or flight. And you guys know what fight or flight is, right? That's the butterflies in your stomach, the heart palpitations, the <sighs> high breathing, the sweaty hands and feet and the cold, clammy, if you came and shook my hand right now, you would know exactly what a fight or flight <laughs> response looks like. Okay, so the body's getting ready already. And then the amygdala also has the power to say, wake up to the rest of the brain. And it says, pay attention to what I'm about to send you. And then it activates the hippocampus, which is like on the side of your head, so where Princess Leia's buns are. And it says, Pull up everything you know about threatening things that look like this, because I might need that information. So it's priming you to already start to create associations of threat. And then finally, all that information gets channeled or processed through the sensory cortex, which is in the back and the sides of the brain. And then it all finally goes to the front. And front, if you look and open up my brain right here, you will see that it's like the Starship Enterprise. Captain Kirk sits right, I know I'm mixing metaphors. <laughs> Sorry about that. Captain Kirk, Han Solo, Han Solo sits right up at the front, no, Captain Kirk does. He sits right up at the front of this, of my Starship Enterprise, and he says, okay, what's going on here? And Uhura's like, oh, the Klingons just showed up, apparated, there, I'm using Harry Potter metaphors now, <laughs> apparated right in front of us, and we don't know what to do. Is it dangerous or not? And Captain Kirk has to say, no, we're on a peace mission with the Klingons, so don't pull up your shields. Or it's like, holy crap, MFSA, get everything up and running. Okay, that's a healthy brain. A healthy brain has this whole thing working for it. What happens is that if, you, if you're in a seriously dangerous situation where the Klingons really just start shooting at you, then amygdala doesn't even have to talk to Captain Kirk. Amygdala can say, all right, fight or flight, just start. Run away, punch, whatever you have to do. And then after the danger's gone, then we'll figure out what that was all about. Yeah? You, you've all, some of you have experienced that before, where you've been almost run over by a bus and you've just jumped out of the way and you're like, what was that? I can't believe that just happened. And you have like reflexes that you thought you never had. So that's your healthy survival instinct. Now what happens is that if you've ever had anything really bad happen to you, your amygdala says, uh-uh, that ain't ever gonna happen to me again. I'm gonna remember that thing. Next time I see a, a yellow bus, a yellow van, a yellow car, anything yellow, I'm gonna start jumping out of the way as soon as I can. 
Or if you know if you're gonna punch it, you might try to punch it or something if you have a really strong fight instinct. So then what I say, what I tell kids is like if you've ever been traumatized, then your alarm never goes on green again. It always stays yellow, orange. And it's like scanning the environment for danger all the time. Or sometimes the alarm can say, I'm gonna just take over the captain's chair. I'm gonna kick Captain Kirk out, and I'm gonna have phaser set to kill all the time. And I'm gonna walk around with a chip on my shoulder. Like I had this teenage boy that I finally got to calm, calm down. Well, he actually came in 16 years old, had gang violence ex experience, and he was coming in for an evaluation for trauma. And he wouldn't listen to me at all. He didn't want to come in. His mother dragged him in. And as soon as they start talking about fights, his foot start to go. And I said, oh, hey, what's going on with your foot? He goes, uh, my foot just shakes. I said, my guess is that your foot is getting ready to kick ass or run away. He's like, what are you talking about? That's crazy. And then I explained the whole fight or flight response. And I said, so even now, just thinking about the fights you had to have when you were 12 years old, your body is starting to relive that already. And he was like fascinated by that. He, no one ever explained how his body works to him and how, the, how his uh, self-protective alarm system works. And then he opened up and he said, then is that, why do I see my grandmother's dead body in the kitchen? Because he had walked into that. And I said, that's part of your trauma response too. That's your body saying, as, to, as soon as you're walking into the kitchen, be careful, this is a dangerous place. This is where bad things happen. It's not that you're crazy, it's trying to protect you from ever seeing another, another loss like that. So I was suddenly ennobling parts of himself that he thought were crazy. His hyperreactivity, his anger issues, his, his hallucinations, they were all efforts to protect him from further harm. And I said, would you mind if we did a breathing exercise right now to help calm your body? And also, I want you to remember you're safe right now. No one's trying to hurt you right now. The goal of this moment is to help you to figure out how to get back into school and, and do a great job, because I was doing a, psych eval a psychological evaluation for IQ testing and stuff like that. And so we did that for a couple minutes and his foot started to slow down. I said, good, now, now we can proceed. And I, and I was just wetting his appetite for the kinds of interventions that you can use to deal with trauma. And by the end of that first session, he, shook, he stood up and he, and he extended his hand. He said, when are we gonna meet again? And so we met for a few times and he went through the whole testing and he was a puppy then. You know, he's like small and like goofy. And then as soon as we walked out of my office and another teenage boy walked into the clinic, boom, the armor came back on and he stared down the kid and I was like, yo, dude, what's going on? What the hell? You're just nice all of a sudden. You're looking like an asshole. <laughs> and he said, I don't know that kid. That kid could be one of my ex-gang members and he could be here to hurt me. And if I had to stare him down, and if he doesn't look away, then I know we have to, we have to fight. And I'll send my mom home, and then I'll, I'll find him, and I'll fight him. I said, yo, that's your alarm talking right now. You don't know this kid. This kid's actually here to find help for himself. He's not here to look for you. But that was the beginning of the conversation about how to educate a young man about how his alarm can hijack his body to protect him from ever being hurt again. Yes. What is the percentage of kids who are experiencing that, like trauma reactive reactivity? It depends on who, what sample you're looking at, but it's anywhere from, from 50 to 90 percent. And you know, if you're in the, if you're in a child welfare or, or juvenile justice system, the it, rates go up. And it's not just one trauma; they have two or three to, two to nine different types of trauma that they've experienced in their lives. And the more types of trauma you've ever had in your life the unhealthier you are as an adult, the more your telomeres are all frayed. Telomeres are like part of the ends of your DNA and they have to do with longe longevity of your life. The more your alarm system gets out of whack, the more stress-related diseases you have. It's pretty bad. Just assume that it's really high and watch The Walking Dead and assume that we're all in a zombie apocalypse where everyone's like fighting for their lives all the time. Okay. Proceed. Kind of acceptable level. Um, he... okay. So note that the teacher's alarm is already like this, roughly like this, right? 
He caught a real nasty attitude about it. Why do I want to leave school? Yeah, I know. He can relax and about his hat uh, and get his hat at the end of the school day. <laughs> or you said at lunchtime? Well, see, I'm at lunchtime if I'm a nice guy and you don't treat me bad. When you leave, he say anything? Yeah, he called me all kinds of names. He was swearing at me and everything. Before he was leaving, he called, no, you know me, I, you know. Uh, but before he left here, I was all kinds of, uh, you know, MF, A, S type oh, stuff. Oh, I see, all right. How are we doing? Come on. Please. How are we doing? The longer you do this, you get a sixth sense. If I get it right, I'm going to find out the root of the problem. Now, I'm my hat back. All right, here's I'm what I want to tell you. So now, how old are you? I'm 18. And see, that's the tough part. And when you get 18, you're like grown, and it's hard to deal with you because you're a young adult. I mean, if my hat was small enough to fit in my pocket, I would put it in my pocket. And he just trying to do this to show me that he got power over me. This and that's that. what I thought. Oh, uh, everyone's reacting to that. So, what we've learned just now is that the, when the teacher starts, when the teacher's alarm starts going up in his teacher mode, he copes by exerting more power. It's common, right? A lot of us do that. We try to control the situation. But exerting power on a kid who has any kind of trauma or abuse history could be a trigger for them. And what I mean by a trigger is just that your alarm says, uh, I, that energy doesn't feel good. That reminds me of the time that my dad beat me or beat my mom. So you better get ready. Obviously you got upset. That's, right. That's what I got. All right. I was trying to figure out what was this about. It's not about the hat. You, know, you, you feel like you didn't get that much respect. Okay. You know how every, all the kids are like, don't diss me. And that means don't disrespect me. And respect is a huge thing in urban, urban youth lives. This is where I want to point out that trauma is a really bad thing. And it's even harder and worse for young men of color inner city young men, men of poor communities, disempowered and disenfranchised communities, where life on the street is just a war zone all the time. So I, I want to make an acknowledgement here that I really believe that racism and oppression are still profoundly influential on the rates of trauma, and, it's, and it will never be diagnosed clinically because the PT diagnosis of PTSD was designed for Vietnam vets coming home from the war. And it doesn't capture the, the, the nature of trauma for inner city young men. Come on. I want to try to keep you in school. So I got the point. The teacher got the point. You got the point. We have to straighten this out for you, teacher. Come on, hold on. We're not finished. Don't walk away. Come on home, yo. Come on, man. Okay, I'm going home, yo. That's the flight response. Okay? So he's getting stressed. And he's like, I can't deal with this. I, I just want to go home. And as you'll see, he's done that many times. This is his third high school. A home over your hat. Hold on. I just know from experience, sometimes these little things can turn into bigger things if you don't do the right thing. This is your third high school. I'm trying to make sure that this year is somehow successful. Because you... I love this. Get an education. All right. Let me bring you over here. I'm trying to figure out a way to make this year successful because you're going to get an education. So if you live like this or like this, basically Captain Kirk has been kicked out. Like It's like the Manchus have taken over your temple and all the Shaolin monks. Oh God, it's another metaphor. <laughs> the Shaolin monks have run away and they don't know how to fight really well yet. And... Um, so now the Shaolin monks have to go off and find that master on top of that mountain and spend three years learning good, like, tiger crane mix. <laughs> Those metaphors are getting outdated, aren't they? Um, so what I tell kids is, like, we need to get Captain Kirk back in his chair. And I'm going to tell you that the, what this part of your brain does really well is impulse control, decision-making, delayed gratification, emotion regulation, and most importantly, self-awareness and also knowing what you care about. Remember, Captain Kirk's job is to know that they want to go boldly where no man has gone before to explore new worlds and whatever else the, he probably knows <laughs> the rest of the, he probably recites this at night before he goes to bed. <laughs> so what we have to do is to help Captain Kirk have more self-awareness, be able to name his feelings, understand what's going on, and to assert assertively say, I want an education.
even though I'm getting mad about my hat, my job right now is to know that I want to get an education. And that's what the principal does for this guy. He starts to activate Captain Kirk. He says, Captain Kirk, get back on this chair. We're both going to work to help control this alarm reaction. Go get your hat. Principal McAfee convinces this angry student to sit down with the teacher who took away his hat. It should be alarmed student, by the way. That's how we should change the language. Not angry student, alarmed, self-protective. And try to work it out. Hi, this is Mr. Wilkins. This is I Mr. want these two people to communicate and solve their problem. Now, that's not what I'm going to get. I'm going to get Anything? Oh, God. Right? Look at that. Who's going who's gonna to be contrite and want to open up whenever you start a conversation? Well, you got anything to say to me? The principal at this moment should have been like, whoa, this was a mistake. Right? This guy's alarm is way too hot. The teacher's alarm is way too hot right now. This is what a trauma-informed school would look like to me. Everyone understands that everyone has an overactive hypersensitive alarm that can go off, and everyone's tracking each other's alarms for them. Because I guarantee you, I don't know when my alarm goes off. I still yell and swear at my girlfriend like crazy, and I end up saying stupid things all the time. If I had someone to say, yo, 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 don't, don't talk right now. You're too hot. That would help me a lot. And we all need that in our lives. And we all need that as teachers, as, as principals. We have to rally together to say, all of us have alarms that can take over. It's not just the, the students. And we all need to support each other in, in tracking our alarms. Yeah, how, how come you only, you only decide to take my hat, comment how I have a hat on the table, and then rather than that, you could you could literally just be like, yo, Will, put the hat in the locker. I don't like that tone. I don't like that tone. I don't like that tone. That's the answer to the, how come you, you did that? Okay, and I know some of you are angry at this teacher right now. And I want you to know that that is your own self-protective alarm kicking in to try to protect the student from being hurt by this teacher. And it's a good thing. It shows how much you care about students doing well. But don't let it become a destructive thing where you want to hurt, like destroy this teacher and, and vilify him for having an overactive alarm too. Okay, so what we also just learned right now is that the teacher has a trigger for tone. This is true for all of us, actually. If you, if you start a conversation with, hey, how are you doing? Then you're like, whoa, what's wrong with you? Why, why do you want to fight all of a sudden? Right? And so the teacher has already has been triggered again to need a fight and to exert more power. Right? Because we've, we've already learned that he, the way he deals with an, his alarm is to exert more control. That's what you're gonna get. You're gonna do no, no, like that's that. not the tone I'm gonna get because you're not following the rules. If the hat is yeah. sitting around, I'm gonna say I'm from where I come from, yo. Adult, no adult, yo. If you're gonna, if you're gonna treat somebody like that, how you expect me to talk to you? Okay, okay. Well, okay here's the deal. How about uh, it's getting worse, right? From this to now, full frontal. Whenever your hips orient to each other, you're either interested in them like romantically, or you know each other really well, or you're about to fight. This is an in incredibly escalating interpersonal thing to do. And whenever you make elbows and everything else bigger, that's also a form of aggression. Every animal does this. Here's the deal. The rule is no hats. Okay, so now the teacher's full on, I'm going to use control, I'm going to use the law, the rules to to exert my alarm response, to exert control in the situation. If I find that the rule is no hats. Hey, yo, man, what the f man? You really begin to piss me off, dog. You're over here running your mouth, and doing this thing, thinking that's your rules, this and that. Listen, and listen to me closely, all right? I don't care about you. I don't give two s about you. Now, sometimes people will say, oh, he really doesn't care, does he? Instead of saying, oh, that's another that's another trauma response. That's a hyperactive alarm saying, I can't care about you because it hurts too much to care. I'm going to live with my damn hat. You have no right to take my hat off no table. If I put my hat on the table, you have the right to be like, well, I don't want the hat there. Put it in the locker. I don't put it in the damn locker. I'm going to ask somebody so I can put it in the locker. You don't want to come to my bedroom. Security comes in. 
And now in the news recently, we've seen what happens when security comes in and they make things worse. And touching a student when they're in alarm mode is not a good idea. No one likes that. Okay, now we have destruction of property. That could be a, a punishable crime. We have disruption of the classroom. So this is where like the prison to pipe, school to prison pipeline starts to really kick in, or could kick in. Hope, hopefully it doesn't. It's a tough world out there for young people. They feel very vulnerable. When they feel disrespected, we're in a lot of trouble. They do things sometimes that don't make any sense. Sometimes it's so easy. You know, when you're dealing with young people, it didn't have to explode. After his attempt to make peace between teacher and student backfires, Chuck McAfee has to clean up the mess. You gotta see his hand, he's a nurse. See his hand. He's gonna have to end up having to pay for this. This way. When things really mess up, it's my fault. Put your hand up. The buck stops here. Okay. What happened? I'm trying to talk to him, but he refused to let me talk. And then he gave me aggravated because he's talking to me like I'm a like, like I'm a first grader. And right, so now I got you're aggravated. So then you turn around, get mad, and punch the window. Yeah. You make me seem like I'm stupid. Okay. Why, why would you say that? How are you going to pay for the window? The police officer, who is another trigger of power control, says, how are you going to pay for that window when he's saying, I feel like a first grader? It makes no sense to say that right then. It's more, it adds insult to injury, right? I, mean, was, I got five little brothers, and my, my mom worked at two jobs, and she can't hardly pay the rent. Then we'll, wait a minute. Then we'll probably talk about some kind of restitution. We'll find a way. All right? Thank you. Okay. It's very hard to be a teacher, because they deal with everything. But they got the heart to do this. I thought this one was going to be an easy one. What happened? He had a tone that I didn't like, and I mentioned it. And he went left. And went bad, and I, I, like, I feel real bad. I mean, I'm like. I know. Let me have this. I thought this one would, would have been an easy one. I don't know what the conversation was, but I know that nobody likes to feel good when kids get angry and put their hands to windows. Yes, sir. All right. So, I don't know. It's about communication. Sometimes we hit it. Sometimes we don't. But if they end up doing this, then we lose. Yeah. That's all. No. Well, no. My mistake, I thought we could work this out. Sometimes it doesn't work. Damn, damn, damn. See, the teacher's not a bad guy. He was just triggered in that moment. And it, for me, it takes 45 minutes before I can talk after my alarm's been going off. I will still try to get into fights with people if my alarm gets off to like a red, red alert. 40th birthday, I almost got into a fight with someone in the dog park. <laughs> The other thing that I would possibly add to a really, really idyllic trauma-informed system, when that principal is talking to the teacher, when he first walks in and he sees the posture like this, he should say, where's your alarm right now? You hot? You, you cool or what? And, then, and if the teacher can say, I'm, I, I'm actually like at a 7 or 8 out of 10 right now for my alarm, then the principal should say, okay, I want us to do a guided meditation right now. You said that you care, you, you said that this kid's not performing in any kind of acceptable way, and that means to me that you really care about this kid succeeding, right? That's the flip side of saying, I'm frustrated with you for not performing. He's saying, I care about you graduating. So, right now I want you to visualize this kid's graduation day you hand him the diploma yourself because you've helped him to reach that point. And he looks at you and he thanks you for believing in him and never, and never letting him like 
cut corners and, and you know, just try to fail out of school. And what does that feel like? And what does that do to your alarm? And the teacher will say, I feel better. And then, and then the principal can say, now you're in the right state of mind to go have a conversation with a, a young man. And what, whatever you say, it doesn't matter because the energy will be right. And the student will, and you, can, you should say, look, I really care about you succeeding. I care about being a good teacher, and I, and I especially want to be a good teacher to you. And if you start a conversation like that, everyone's alarms start to go, ah, oh, Captain Kirk is back in, in control. Final questions? Uh, the question is whether or not I think PTSD diagnosis will ever be more inclusive. I don't think so, honestly. Uh, we made a valiant effort to include a new diagnosis for trauma called developmental trauma disorder into the most recent DSM-5, and they didn't want to hear it. They said, if you want that, do your own research, and we raised like $150,000 to do a field trial for developmental trauma disorder, and I think we're still trying to publish that data. But we showed them what the criteria were going to be, and they said, this looks like anyone could fit into this. And we're like, yes, that's exactly the point. <laughs> they said, it looks like ADHD, psychosomatic stressors. It looks like mini borderline personality disorder or like anxiety disorders. And we're like, yes, that's our point. Stop giving kids seven diagnoses and seven antipsychotics and just give them trauma. Okay, so the question is, can kids really have that self-reflective moment to rate how alarmed they are? I think that's a really good point. You don't have to. The better thing to do is to say, look how much you care about justice right now. Look how much you care about being treated fairly. So you immediately play Captain Kirk. As the alarm starts to go down, then you say, "Do we need, like, tell me where your alarm is. If you don't mind, you have to ask for permission about this. And what happens is that if it's just like practicing free throws. The more you practice rating yourself alarm, and then the better you are and able to do it under high performance situations. Like if you ever study sports psychology, I think that's another great avenue to get a trauma-informed practice. Because sports psychology, I read this book, it said, when you're about to shoot your free throw, have a routine, do a grounding exercise, do breathing, and then activate your highlight reel. The best shots you've ever taken in your life. The moment when you're like making the game-winning championship point and you're like being carted off by all your teammates and then shoot the free throw. And I swear to you, your performance will be much better. So what does a trauma-informed organization really look like? So uh, I am kind of um, not the norm, what, what everyone else will say, because they will say uh, trauma-informed screenings, trauma-informed assessments, trauma-informed treatments. And I think all I care about is that everyone recognizes that we are all vulnerable to having our, our alarms take over. And we all work super hard to see the best in ourselves, to uncover hidden heroes in each of us. That anytime you see an alarm reaction, it's often protecting a really important virtue and goal. And the more we operate from a place of seeing the good in each of us and what we're trying to accomplish and our best intentions, the better we'll be able to protect all of us from having a trauma reactions take over. That's the simple core of what I think a trauma informed system looks like, but then the actual details of execution means that you have to ask about, I wouldn't even ask about traumas in a school. You don't need to know. But maybe every school could have, what are your triggers? What are your hot buttons? What makes you like lose control? So ask about triggers and then have a safety plan. Whenever you start getting hot, since we all lose our cool and we can't control ourselves, what do you want? Do you want other people to help you keep your cool? And how could you, what works? And, and then. Pull out a pull out your emergency safety plan whenever you or take have a chill out space, not a timeout space, a chill out space where kids can have a box where they can do self soothing regulatory exercises, or they can write letters to themselves saying, you, "This is what you care about. Do this, like be a good son, be a good student, you, or not be a, a you are a good person. Really own that. Even though right now you're feeling unhappy and upset, you are still a good person because trauma will rob you of ever believing that you're worth being loved, being taken care of, of having anything good ever happen to you again.